Would you join me in prayer, please? Let's ask the Lord uh, to be present and to prepare our hearts. Father God, we come before you this morning as, as believers. We come before you this morning as followers of the cross. We come before you as followers of yours, O oh, my Father. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we delight in your presence. We seek for your guidance. My Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would be with us, that you would speak through me, that you would awaken in us, my Father, our calling. I pray you to be exalted through all that we uh, do here today. And and I just pray, my Father in heaven, I'm so delighting in you right now, Lord. I just feel your Holy Spirit, and I'm just delighting just to be in your presence. And I just pray, my Father, that all of us can feel that presence, and that all of us can feel you right here, right now. Speak through me, Father. Speak through me. Open hearts, open ears, that all who you intend to hear will hear and what you intend to be preached, be, be preached. Thank you, my Father, and, and, and I say hallelujah to you. Be glorified and exalted, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm not going to ask you to... Uh, to open to a particular passage this morning because I'm... I'm doing something a little bit different today. Uh, in fact, this is going to be kind of a, a tag team uh, sermon, tag team. Uh, I'm going to open up and then I'm going to give uh, my brother Alex Fallo a chance to, uh, to share with you as well. So, um, so just, just open your heart and, and be expecting that God is in charge and, and he will guide us, guide us both. I, I wanted, I really feel I wanted to, to do this today and, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about discipleship. And I, I want to talk to you about being uh, disciples of Jesus. And... Um, I, I don't think there was a bigger missionary in all of the history of Christianity than Jesus Christ himself. I don't know if you ever consider him as a missionary, but I think it is important that we understand that Jesus came into the world from heaven, from his Father, with a particular ministry and a particular mission that he needed to accomplish. Uh, I, I believe with all my heart that God himself is a missionary God. I believe God has been sending mission teams throughout the beginning of history until now and even beyond us. He's been sending missionary teams so that he can get the hearts and the ears of his people. Whether it's prophets, sages, kings, apostles, God is in the business of sending his word and praying that his word will not return to him empty. So what we have and what I want to say to you is that Jesus came to this earth from heaven on a very specific mission from the Father. Very specific mission from the Father. And he came basically to reverse, to reverse the consequences of the fall. Jesus came to reverse the consequences of the fall of the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. You know, we talk about sin, and sometimes that word sin has become so predominant that, that we think we understand what it is, and we even begin to take it for granted. We just say sin and, and we take it for granted. 
But one of the things that is so important we understand is that sin is rebellion. Sin is an act of rebellion against God. It is a, an act of rebellion where you and I think and others think that we have the right to sit on our own throne and make our own decisions independent from God. Jesus came to reverse the consequences and the conditions brought about by the fall of Adam and Eve. The first one that we can probably consider as a rebel against God is the devil himself. We know from scripture because we are told that the devil is a creation of God. That he was an angel of great beauty named Lucifer or big light or great light. And he decided that he was going to rebel against the authority of God. He was going to usurp the throne of the God of the universe who created it all, and he was going to enthrone himself as God over all creation. Of course, we know that he was defeated and that God threw him down from heaven and he came to earth. So he's the first rebel against God. And then come Adam and Eve and are placed in the garden by the goodness of God in his creation. And the greatest rebel of all, of all began to speak to the mind and the heart of Adam and of Eve and primarily Eve at the beginning but then Adam and begins to draw them into an act of rebellion against God because that's what he was doing. The crafty, rebellious Satan began to tell the innocent, created, good man and good woman in perfect relationship with God. He began to say to them, now notice this, he does not come out and says, Adam, Eve, let's rebel against God, join my cause. He kind of goes around and he, he says, do you see that fruit? It is beautiful. God made it. Must have been for something. Why not eat it? Right? And he begins to talk to them and says, Did God really say that? Are you sure that God said not to eat of that tree? Why would he have created if you weren't going to eat of it? And he kind of begins to, to taunt and to, and to put in the mind of Eve at first and then Adam that if they ate of that fruit of the tree of good and evil that they themselves would become gods or like God. In all authority, in all power, they could do whatever they wanted no more obeying somebody else. You'd be at par with God. And he begins to inject his venom into the heart of these two people. And rebellion against God is born. Rebellion against God is born. The desire to go against what God had said. The desire to become like God. The desire to oppose God if need be. They begin to believe, conceive the idea that they don't have to listen to God and they can become their own gods. And that is really what's behind the fall. It's an act of rebellion, an opposition to the things that God has asked of us. An act of rebellion. And that act of rebellion wasn't just something that Adam and Eve 
were involved in, I, I believe with all my heart that because of the fall, humanity as a whole, humanity as a whole becomes tainted with the idea of rebellion, whether we intend to or not. We, we are tainted with the idea, and we hear it all over the place, that this is my body, this is my life, this is, I can do whatever I want, and nobody's going to tell me what to do. That is just rebellion. And that gets tainted into, I would say, almost the DNA of Adam and Eve, and then eventually is passed on to his kid, kids, Abel, and Cain, and Seth, and all the others, unto today, we still have an attitude sometimes of rebellion against authority, and especially the authority of God. Sin is an act of rebellion, and the consequences of that rebellion is that sin was born, Sin did not exist before, at least for the humans. Sin did not exist for Adam and Eve. Eternity is what they were created for. As long as they ate of the tree of life, they would live forever. The moment they rebelled against God, they were removed from the garden so that they could no longer eat of the tree of eternal life. They're removed and they go into creation and all of creation is tainted. All of creation begins to be broken. All of creation begins to suffer the consequences of the fall. And the product of that is that death also is born. Death is born because of sin. Because we no longer come into the garden to eat of the tree of eternal life. And with death also came condemnation. The idea that we have become the enemies of God. Jesus comes from the Father with a mission to reverse the condition and the consequences of the fall. To restore what had been broken. That image of God with which Adam and Eve were created and was broken. To be restored so that we can own again the identity that we are God's children. That we can recover the image of God and grow into the image of his son Jesus Christ. Jesus comes as a missionary to reverse the conditions of that rebellion of Adam and Eve. He came on a mission. But one of the things I want you to notice is that the moment Jesus started his ministry, one of the first things that Jesus did, one of the first things that Jesus did is he called a group of guys there were others around him, but he called in particular 12 men and he began to train them. He began to train them and he said to them that he, his mission would have to become their mission. Because Jesus knew that part of the mission was for him to die on a cross. He knew that one of the part of his mission is that he would be crucified. He would die for the sins of the world because sin could not be taken away except blood be shed. And it was the blood of the Son of God that could take away that sin of the world that was born in the fall. So Jesus knew his blood was going to have to be shed. And that he would rise again. And that he would ascend to the right hand of the Father. If the mission was going to continue, he was going to have to give it to these 12 men that he had chosen. 
They were the ones that were going to have to continue the mission, the preaching of the gospel, the sharing of the word of Jesus, the work of the Lord, the ministry of the Lord was going to have to be shared and passed on from Jesus to the disciples. And so he spends three years training them to take on the mantle of missionaries to the world. And in order for them to be able to follow Jesus, they had to abandon certain things. I mean, you couldn't follow Jesus and then keep going back to your old job. They had to give up their job. They gave up family. They gave up friends. They gave up the pursuits that they had before. They gave up their dreams. They gave up everything so that they could follow Jesus. And these 12 men left everything. Some were older, some were younger, but all of them left whatever their lives was about so that they could spend time with Jesus, being trained, being equipped to become themselves missionaries out in, in the world. And the thing that is of interest is that they too knew they were going to die. Amen? Because nobody lives forever. But if the mission of Jesus was going to keep moving forward through the centuries, those missionaries of Jesus had to make other missionaries and other disciples and send them out into the world as well. And he basically, they basically sent disciples that can make disciples. Missionaries that can send other missionaries. If the word of God is going to remain being preached in the world until Jesus Christ comes, the mission of Jesus must maintain itself being passed from generation to generation to generation until the whole world is reached with the gospel. But may Jesus find the church doing the mission and the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is the first missionary. He gives it to the twelve. And then the twelve begin to send out more missionaries. Making more missionaries. Making more disciples. And sending them out into the world. We find at the beginning of Matthew. Jesus says to the disciples. Come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Or I will make you fishermen. Come, come follow me, it's about Jesus. Come follow me, I will make you first. I will make you first so that you can go and fish others. You understand? I will make you fishermen so that you can go and do the fishing. I will equip you so that you can go out and equip others. Toward the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he gives what we all know as the Great Commission. And Jesus said to them, just before he ascended to heaven, just before he ascended to heaven, you might even say these are the last words of Jesus, his last testament, his last order for the disciples. All authority on heaven, in heaven and earth are given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you forever to the ends of the age. The commandment of Jesus, the authority with which Jesus came from heaven, was that we also, the disciples and all of us, be missionaries who make missionaries, disciples who make disciples, until all of the nations have heard the gospel of Jesus. Go and make disciples of all nations and teach them every single thing I've ever taught you, you are to teach to others. 
Because that's the mission. That was the mission of Jesus. That was the mission of the twelve. And that is the mission of every believer that comes to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's up to you and me. We are the ones today who need to read the Great Commission and say that's not about Peter. That's not about John. That's about me. I'm being sent into the world by the authority of Jesus and with the authority of Jesus as his missionary in my world, in my environment, in my days. Because when Jesus comes, he needs to find me faithful to the mission. And I will be a disciple that makes disciples because one day will come that I myself will no longer be here. But those that I make disciples today will continue the mission until Jesus returns. And people will be saved every day by the word of God as long as there are disciples who are faithful to the mission of Jesus. The best description I've ever heard or read about being a disciple, it, it was a Jewish proverb, and I've probably mentioned it before, I'm sure I have, but there's a Jewish proverb that says, find a teacher and be covered by his dust. Find a teacher, a rabbi, and be covered by his dust. And, and I love it, I love that simple description because it says to me that if I want to be a disciple of Jesus, I have to follow him so close that the dust of his, of his sandals begin to fall on me. That doesn't happen if he's at a distance from me or I'm way ahead of him. That only happens if I'm walking right behind him, letting every word that he speaks be heard, letting everything that he does be seen, and every commandment that he makes becomes my commandment. Find a teacher, a rabbi. Well, I have found my rabbi. You have found your rabbi. That's Jesus. Now we have to walk so closely with him that the dust of his feet cover us. To me, that's the greater description of what it means to be a disciple. I also believe with all my heart that the church has no greater mission and no greater reason for existence than one to worship God. If you were to ask me what is the, the job of the church, why does the church exist, I would say first of all is to worship God. Is to lift him up, to exalt him, to glorify him. By the way, worship doesn't mean sing. It is part of worship, but it's not just sing to Jesus and go out there and, and not be worthy or make him worthy. The word worship comes from the root worth-ship. It is to make and do everything possible that will make him worthy, that will declare his worthiness. To worship is to lift him up in our lives, whether you're in church or not in church. Worship is not about music or singing. Worship is about a life that lives, is lived out in such a way that God, Jesus Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit is lifted up. The job of the church for which we exist is number one, is to worship God. But number two is to make disciples that make disciples. You can call it evangelism, you can call it sharing the word, you can call it whatever you want, but basically the mission of the church must be passed on from generation to generation until the end comes and Jesus will be with us all the way through them. To worship and to be a disciple and to become a disciple and to make disciples that make disciples. If that is the job of the church, it is my intention with all my heart till my last day, number one, for me to continue to become a disciple of Jesus, to continue to seek him, to continue to listen, to continue to be covered by his dust, to continue to walk closely with him, but it is also my job to make disciples of all of you. Disciples that make disciples. 
And for that reason is that today I'm starting that class, Discipleship 101. It is a class, there's about 13 people that signed up. And that class, and some of the people that signed up, it's not because they're not already disciples or know the word in, in many ways. The idea of the class is that I'm going to train you not only to be in the word, but I'm going to train you how to use the material to become disciple makers in your neighborhoods, among your family, in, at work, and everywhere you can find someone willing to, to, to meet with you for one hour, once a week, so that you can begin to disciple them. And once you're done with them, you can send them off so that they can begin to disciple somebody else. The class that I'm about to start today, Discipleship 101, is for us together to go through being discipled, but also to learn what, how to make disciples. All of the material that we use is going to be given right back to you and you take it home and I will reproduce it for you so that you can start meeting with others and you begin to make disciples. That's the purpose for the class. And when I finish this class, I'm going to start another one and another one and another one until the day I die. Because that is what the church is about. Making disciples of Jesus Christ. And I will start new groups. And I will go to my neighborhood. And I will do whatever. And whoever wants to meet with me. Even if it's one on one. I will disciple that person. And send them off to make other disciples. That's the purpose for the class. That I'm about to start today. We have a group of people signed up. And there's room for others. If anybody else wants to as well be part of that. But I also wanted to introduce to you another discipleship program that is used in many churches, but I want to speak particularly about our church. The class that I'm about to teach is about 13 weeks, about 13 sessions, so it's about 13 weeks. But we also have another program called Cursillo. How many of you have heard of Cursillo? Okay, many people at St. David's have heard of Cursillo. Cursillo is a weekend. But I, that's where I want to tag Alex uh, to come up, top, uh, come up here and tell us uh, about uh, Cursillo. And the reason that I, I've asked Alex, Alex to come is that Alex is going to be the leader of the next men's Cursillo. And because he's going to be the leader, I thought he'd be the best person to come and tell us about the weekend. This is about disciples that make disciples. Also, as you leave, come on, Alex. Also, as you leave today, if you want more information, there is a brochure in our welcome table right outside the door about what Cursillo is and what you can do about Cursillo. There are some things that need, need to be changed. The bishop's name has changed since we made this, but this gives you all of the information on Cursillo. But let's, let's talk about that a moment. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Father Jose. I um, kind of ran out of the house this morning after printing my notes up, and I didn't realize that my notes were in like three font. So I'll do the best I can. <laughs> can barely read them, but uh, thank you for giving me this, um, really this opportunity to talk about Curcio. It's something that's really dear to me. Uh, it's an event that's held uh, once a year in September, the third week of September for the men and the fourth weekend of September for the women. And it's, it's certainly apropos that we talk about it today as Father Jose begins his classes on discipleship because I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that a big part of discipling is developing relationships. And, you know, discipling isn't just about telling or teaching of the gospel. It's about loving and caring first. And that love and care that we get from Jesus is what we pass on to others as we disciple them about the Word of God. My wife, uh, Deanne, and I, we did our Curcio back in 2011 which means we went through the three-day weekend uh, at actually the last place they had it at Green Oak Ranch in Vista. That was the last time they had it at Green Oak Ranch. That place was large enough really to accommodate the weekend for both men and women, although we were separated by gender. 
The current Curcio is held in Pomona, and since it's a smaller compound, that's why they separate the weekends between men and women. We went through an alpha course, my wife and I, the year before, and we were really on fire to learn more about what Jesus had in store for us individually and as a couple. We already had the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, but we wondered how we could use what we felt deep, deep down inside, how we could use that to, to further his message, to share with people what we had experienced, what we were feeling, and how we wanted everyone else to have the same. We know the reason behind all of that, of course, is God. None of us can fully explain how he teaches each person in his own way. But when it comes to evangelizing, some of us automatically think that that's all about going out two by two with a Bible in hand and knocking on doors. But the way I see it, nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, for me, Curcio helped me approach evangelizing as a natural act of being Christ-like within my day-to-day -day activities. I think we believe that most people want to live their lives in a Christ-like manner, but the world we live in makes it really hard. Curcio gives you a method and provides you with tools and a mindset and a strength and a support to make this natural type of evangelizing possible. It's about learning what's fundamental to being a Christian. It helps us develop a deeper understanding of what it means to be fully Christian. If I had to define Curcio, I would say that it motivates and teaches us to evangelize the community wherever we are, wherever we live, wherever we work, and wherever we play. It kind of goes back to what I said earlier. It makes it possible for us to live out our lives as Christians naturally and not in any way forced. It helps us fulfill our responsibility to go forth and proclaim the gospel. We can't do that by sitting around passively and hoping that the world eventually comes to Christ. We have to make a conscientious effort to tell the world about Christ. It's about developing relationships, as I started my talk this morning. We have a saying in the movement that says, make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Jesus. That really expresses who we are. As humans, we've always been about relationships, right? Husband, wife, parent, child, friends. It's a part of our very nature as human beings. I'll never forget how Deanna and I felt after our weekend. The love that we experience from everyone is truly indescribable. As a matter of fact, to this day, I believe that that love is still with me. Some of the people here today were part of that incredible experience, as it would be for you. The teachings during the Curcio weekend were basic to being a Christian, but presented in a way that allowed me to learn and see things differently. Curcio helped and allowed me and Deanna also to meet some really great people that we otherwise would have never had the opportunity to get to meet and know. And some of those people have become really close friends. And there are many others that I always long to see each year that we've, I've developed a bond and a love with, which really came initially from Jesus, passed on to them, and that can never be taken away. I just want to share a quick story with you that some of you may have already heard. As a matter of fact, some of you may be tired of hearing it, but I, it's important to me. You know, when I finished the weekend back in 2011, a verse from Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, stuck with me the entire weekend. I don't know why other than to say that I was really struck by the simplicity of the message. And that verse reads, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. About a week after that weekend, I asked Deanna to pick up some thank you cards for me at the Christian bookstore because I wanted to send cards out to some of the people involved in the weekend. When I opened the box, the verse on the lower back of the card, which was nowhere to be seen on the outside of the box, so Deanna could not have known that verse was in there, 
was Colossians 3.17. So I believe that God affirmed his message to me. After last year's Curcio, September of 2016, when I was asked to be rector for this year, I picked that verse to be my theme for the weekend, this upcoming weekend. That was, as I mentioned, 11 or 10 months ago. Two weeks ago, I received in the mail a t-shirt I had bought from an online Christian apparel store. The t-shirt didn't have this verse on it. But to my surprise, it came in a plastic pouch that had the verse Colossians 3.17 on it. That's an affirmation that Jesus walks with us as we serve him. He's reminding me, you know, we always hear about Jesus, about how God talks to us. He talks to us in different ways. And he spoke to me when I opened that package. I'm blessed to be the director for this year's Casillo, which means, of course, I'll be leading the weekend along with Father Jose as lead spiritual director. And I'll have many friends helping during the weekend. These men are all what we call Curseistas, people that have been through the Curseo weekend. One of the blessings that we receive as Curseistas is the opportunity to go back and work and serve those who are going through the weekend. It's an experience I look forward to each year as much for the joy and the faces I see of those that are going through the weekend as it is working closely with my brothers, serving those who seek to serve Jesus and to spread his message. If you decide that this is something you want to do, and I really encourage you to do so, the weekend is free to you. You'll have a sponsor that will pay for the weekend, pick you up on Thursday, take you out to dinner, drop you off at the compound in Pomona, and pick you back up on Sunday. Everything will be taken care of for you. But I'll caution you that you'll also be fed a lot of great food. As laity in the church, we shouldn't take our roles lightly. We have to realize that we, all of we as individuals, we can have a huge impact in our society. And more importantly, we can have an even greater impact when we find other individuals that are ready and able to accept that challenge. So I hope you join me this year at uh, the Curcio. It'll be September 21 through September 24. If you're interested, I have some applications in the back that you can fill out. Alex will be the rector of the uh, men's weekend, and uh, a lady from San Diego will be the rectora or the leader of the women's weekend. The men's weekend happens first, and then followed immediately by the women's weekend. So I'm offering you here two opportunities to be discipled and two opportunities to be equipped as disciplers. One is a 13-week course with me. We're going to go step by step as to what it means to be a disciple, and I will give you all of the materials that you will need to go ahead and make other disciples. And we're also offering you the possibility of one weekend, an intensive weekend, where you will be taken from the normal life, your home, uh, your business, your jobs, for one weekend to live entirely in community of believers. And in those four days or three days, beginning Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday until about 3, 3.30, you will be with brothers and sisters who their whole life is just to lift you up, to support you, to feed you, to have fun with you, but also to teach you uh, many, many things. In one weekend, you can get uh, most of uh, what it means to be a disciple and be, you already talked, you can, no, no, you already, <laughs> no, no, come here, come here, Alex. <laughs> I feel, I, I, I just wanted to add that if there's ever an opportunity for you to attend a Curcio, this would be the best weekend because there's many people here at St. David's who have been to a Curcio who will be working. So one of my right-hand mans is Tom Leaney. He'll be my head cook. Uh, Junior's going to be working. Premi's going to be there. Jimmy's going to be an advisor for me. So there's a lot of people, obviously, Father Jose, that will be working there. So you'll have a lot of support from people that you know. So this would be the greatest time, I think, uh, although any time that you go would be great, uh, for, you to, for you to attend. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Now, Alex, Alex and I have a very, very uh, strong relationship. We're related uh, in many ways. Uh, that's why I can play around with him and he with me. But um, so what the church is about is making disciples. Because that's what Jesus came. Jesus came as a missionary from the Father. He made more disciples, sent those to make more disciples until we ourselves have been brought to the Lord through the discipleship ministry of somebody else. And now it is our turn to be equipped, to be sent out, to make additional disciples for Jesus Christ until the whole entire earth is covered with the gospel and the mission of Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of the church. If there's no other purpose than to worship God, lift Him up, and to make disciples of Jesus among all the nations. So you have two opportunities here that we are presenting you with. And uh, as Alex said, all you have to say is, I want to go, and we will find a sponsor. There'll be no cost to you whatsoever. You will be taken care of from Thursday night when you get picked up to when you're brought back to your home. And you will join a community of people on fire for the Lord. And so we are inviting you, if it is something that the Lord is putting in your heart, that you talk to me, talk to Alex, talk to Jim Coburn. He's our representative uh, to the secretariat, the kind of the vestry of the Cursillo movement. But if you have any questions at all, talk to us. We are more than, than, than willing and able to help you uh, get to Cursillo. But if you want to be part of the class, Please join us today uh, after church from 1 to 2.30 or so. And uh, we'll just be working together at making disciples that make disciples. Amen? Amen. So no excuse. Stand with me, please.